EV103 study, I think, is a pretty exciting study, and I'm really honored to be um, uh, able to present the data at um, the ASCO annual meeting this year. Um, so it's a, um, a multi-arm study um, that is looking at the combination of Infortimab Vidotin. This is an antibody drug conjugate um, directed against Nectin-4. The, the drug itself is MMAE, monomethyl or statiny, which is a type of chemotherapy. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it's um, being given to patients with urothelial cancer, or really metastatic, conventionally called bladder cancer. Um, so so um, Informat Bidotin has actually been developed as a, as a monotherapy by itself in a number of different trials. Um, the most uh, recent phase three trial actually just reported the EV301 study, which showed that um, as a single agent in patients who've already had chemotherapy and have already had immune therapy, that infortimab vidotin by itself actually has a fair amount of activity with almost about a 50% response rate in a very kind of heavily pretreated patient population. Um, and so that's exciting data because it's now FDA approved um, in the United States, I think since 2019, um, to, to treat um, very advanced metastatic urothelial cancer. Because the drug is so active at, by itself, um, investigators, my colleagues and I, um, talked with uh, the company that makes this, Seattle Genetics, now called CGen, about doing a study where um, we combine infortimab vidotin with other therapies that are either all are already approved or in development for urothelial cancer. Um, and the most, I think, um, interesting one of those, at least in my, on my take, was to combine it with immune therapy, PD-1 immune therapy, specifically a drug called pembrolizumab. Um, and so the study started out with a dose escalation where we're combining infortimab vidotin and pembrolizumab together, and then into a dose expansion cohort to see you know, what the activity was. And instead of giving it late in the course of therapy after you know, uh, uh, cancers become resistant to chemo or the cancers become resistant to immune therapy, this study is looking in treatment naive patients. So patients who've never had um, systemic therapy for metastatic urothelial cancer, and specifically in a patient population that is not eligible for cisplatin-based chemotherapy. Cisplatin is the sort of standard of care chemotherapy as of now, as of 2021. When patients are ineligible for cisplatin chemotherapy, often they're offered carboplatin chemotherapy, but the outcomes are, are not as good for those patients. Um, so so the, the study really focuses on this um, metastatic, cisplatin-ineligible urothelial cancer population and is investigating this combination of both Infortimab, Vidotin, and other partners. In the poster we're presenting now at ASCO, we're presenting the um, uh, what's called cohort A, which was the first cohort, which looks at the um, uh, e combination of EV and pembrolizumab together, both with the uh, five patients who are included in the dose escalation, and then the 40 patients were included in dose expansion. And we have just about two years of follow-up, in fact, a little over two years of follow-up for all these patients as a median follow-up. Um, and so uh, some of this data has been presented before um, in at uh, ESMO meeting and at previous ASCO meetings, but this uh, sort of um, is the longest term follow-up we have to date for this study. So the study itself, as I mentioned, um, is looking at the first 45 patients included in the trial. Um, when we look at the baseline characteristics, it's pretty representative of um, a metastatic urothelial cisplatin ineligible population. About 80% of the patients who uh, enrolled were men. The average age was just under 70 years old. Most of the patients were ECOG 0 or 1, the, uh, over 80% of the patients. The majority had uh, cancer of the bladder as opposed to the upper tracts, although we did have 33% of patients had disease in the ureters and the renal pelvis. Um, most patients had visceral metastatic disease. 84% of the patients had disease in, in an organ. And uh, of them, 31% or 31% of all the patients had liver metastatic disease. And that's important because patients who have cancer metastatic to the liver have a much worse prognosis. Um, so especially cisplatin-ineligible patients with metastatic disease in the liver have a, a really... Um, 
fortunately with poor outcomes compared to other patients. Um, there was a fair splay of um, whether patients were PDL1 positive or negative, or whether just we didn't have the data on that. It was just about even between those three groups. Um, perhaps the most exciting data was looking at the response rates. So what we saw were that 93% of patients had some shrinkage of tumors um, from their initial scans, from their baseline scans. Um, of them, or actually, should say of the total, 73% had confirmed responses by RESIST criteria. Um, and just to put that in context, the most recent phase three trials um, that reported in this basically similar patient population, this is the Keno 361 study and the Invigor 130 study, the overall response rates to, um, to chemotherapy plus PD-1 therapy in those trials were on the order of 40 to 50%. I think the highest response rate was 54% in the, in the keynote study. Um, this is 73%, so that's significantly higher. And while it's a, a smaller study, you know, it's only 45 patients, it's not hundreds of patients, um, it's still quite encouraging and quite exciting to see the, the majority of patients, and almost the vast majority of patients, having some response to this um, regimen. I think the other important piece here is that it's a regimen that doesn't include traditional chemotherapy, right? There's no platinum involved here. Um, and while platinum has activity and, you know, can be effective against erythelial cancer, it also carries a lot of side effects, you know, toxicity, neuropathy, myelosuppression, and risks for um, organ damage to the kidneys uh, uh, and nerves. And, um, so, you know, avoiding platinum is, is actually, I think, a, a fairly worthy goal for, for a lot of these patients. Looking at the responses, the responses actually happened um, in patients who were pdl one positive as well as pdl one negative. And I think that's quite important as well. It implies that you don't need to screen people for pdl one status in order to give them this combination, assuming this, this data holds up in, in larger studies. Um, and they didn't actually screen patients for Nectin-4, which is the target of infortimab. Um, and that's because earlier studies have shown that, you know, 80 to 90% of your epithelial cancers have high levels of Nectin-4 expression. And, you know, we didn't want to exclude people um, based on, you know, the fact that most patients were going to be positive regardless. Um, when patients responded, they responded early. So the average time, the median time to the first response was only two months. So you can give this therapy and see, at least in the study, when we gave the therapy, we saw that people were responding fairly quickly. That's somewhat reassuring that we don't have to wait a long time to see responses. And then when we look at the longer term outcomes, once a patient's responding, the median duration of response was 25 months. So that's over two years of responding. And, and that's like basically unprecedented for urothelial cancer to see patients start responding and then continue to respond for two years. To really put this in context, if you jump back 10 years ago, there was a phase three trial of uh, carboplatin and gemcitabine. And the overall uh, survival in that study, the median time that patients lived was only nine months. And here we have a study that's showing just remarkably um, want better outcomes. The overall survival in this study at, uh, with, with the median follow-up of, of uh, just over two years is 26 months. You compare that back to nine months, which is what we had about 10 years ago. So, you know, this is really, again, it's a phase two study. So it's, you know, I don't want to overemphasize the data, but this is pretty exciting. And when we do phase one, phase two trials, this is really the, um, the um, what we're looking for is a signal. And I think this is a fairly robust signal. Um, to finish up, the toxicity of the, of the regimen is actually pretty similar to what we've observed in, um, before when, when the study was presented previously. Um, overall, it seems fairly well tolerated. Um, most patients had um, some side effects. I think peripheral sens sensory neuropathy was perhaps the most common, um, and that's a, an on-target effect of the um, MMA chemotherapy. Um, skin issues, rashes, and pruritus, and, and other um, uh, uh, skin problems was also fairly common. So we saw about 60% um, of patients, 66% of patients had any skin reaction. Of them, there were of the total, about 20% had grade three um, reactions. Almost all of those were addressable and treatable. 90% of them got better with treatment. Um, the, the sensory neuropathy um, 
occurred almost at a similar frequency. Fortunately, the severe sensory neuropathy was only about 4% of patients. Um, that was harder to, to, to fix. Certainly dose reductions can help or dose holds. So that's about two thirds of patients have improvement in neuropathy. Um, but it's, it's a certainly a consideration with this regimen. Um, the, and the rest of the side effects are listed in the poster. Um, I think the, the other important uh, piece of the uh, when we look at the toxicity data, the adverse event data is that um, we didn't see immune related adverse events at a higher frequency than what we've seen previously with pembrolizumab studies. So it doesn't appear, at least in this cohort, that adding infortimapidotin to pembrolizumab um, increases the number of immune related adverse events. So putting it all together, I think this is a pretty remarkable um, uh, uh, findings in the sense that we're having, you know, uh, the majority of patients are responding to this regimen. It's platinum free. It's in a patient population that historically has had poor outcomes with um, being cisplatin ineligible, as well as having a fair amount of patients with liver metastatic disease. You know, with for the first time ever, we're reporting the median overall survival, which is 26 months, which I think is unprecedented in, in, this, in this group. Again, it's a, it's a, a sort of phase one, phase two study. So, um, we need, you know, we need more patients and we need larger um, cohorts to, to really confirm this. Um, as a last piece, the, um, while, while this data is focused on cohort A, which is the combination of infortimab and pembrolizumab, there is a cohort K to this trial that's also accruing. And that's a randomized cohort where patients are randomized, basically the same entry criteria, but randomized to getting either infortimab alone or infortimab plus pembrolizumab, you know, which is the regimen we just talked about. And that's going to try and evaluate the relative contribution of the EV versus the EV plus pembro. And that, if that's positive, that may be enough to, um, uh, you know, seek regulatory approval for the, for the um, combination. Um, and so I think putting it all together, it's, it's, a, it's a, again, it's a big honor for me to be able to present this data. And I think it's, it's quite exciting. The pd one biomarker in urothelial cancer is very complex. It's not a one-to-one -one where if someone is pd one positive, they definitely respond to immune therapy. And if they're pd one negative, they don't. And if you look across about five different clinical trials, there's sort of five different results. For example, in the um, Keynote 045 study, it didn't matter. This is a second line study of pembrolizumab. Didn't matter what the pd one status was. The response rates were almost identical. Whereas in the Keynote 052 study, it did seem to matter. Um, and their same drug, almost the same patient population, or at least a similar patient population. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure what the future holds for PDL1 testing in urothelial cancer. I don't actually screen people um, with, with very limited exceptions. I don't screen people and decide on PDL1 therapy based just on the PDL1 results. Um, but it's in evolution, and I think it's important to like um, look for this during as we do these trials to try and be clear about what's going on. Um, there is, I sort of alighted over it at the beginning, but there is a the, sort of the rationale beyond just saying we have two active drugs, pembrolizumab and EV, and urothelial cancer. There's some preclinical evidence that when um, cancer cells are treated with um, EV and with this with this um, MMAE that when they die, that it's actually, uh, the immune system is involved. There's immunogenic cell death. So it involves the immune system coming in and either killing the cancer cells or helping to sort of um, identify cancer cells and, and kill them. And so the thought is that maybe there's synergy, you know, by adding EV to Pembro with the idea that it's not just one plus one equals two, but maybe one plus one equals three. And it's, that's not been proven by any means. I don't, I don't sort of claim that that's what's happening here, but you know, that's the hope that we're actually generating a sort of waking up the immune system, if you will, to, to, to recognize the cancer.